But it was Rembrandt who all of a sudden seemed to be giving off a bad smell. The smell of someone from whom the fickle goddess Fortune was shying away. Have you ever felt at the top of your form, at the height of your powers, an odd but distinct sense that the winds just change direction? It's blowing a bit chillier now. Rembrandt's troubles came to him unremarkably, like the first heavy drops of rain striking a window pane. A mild disturbance, but then a downpour. The portrait commissions dry up, the house is loaded with debt, and inside the house Saskia is deathly ill with TB, her body racked by spasms of bloody coughing. Death was no stranger to their family. Saskia and Rembrandt had already buried three of their children. Only the boy Titus was alive. On the 5th of June, 1642, a notary was called to the house to record Saskia's will. Nine days later, she was dead. Her body was wrapped in a simple cloth, and in a silent little procession, it was taken to the outer kirk for burial. Somewhere in this house, Rembrandt pulled out a portrait of her that he'd begun many years before, at the playful start of their life together. It's unusual for many reasons, one of the only paintings in which there's not a trace of a smile. Her head is turned in profile, the outline un-Rembrandtian in its enamel-like sharpness. But for the last time, he's loaded her with fabric and jewels. It's as if he can't stop draping her. But Saskia pulls the fur cape around her, as if to ward off the chill of mortality. But it's too late. Well then, Saskia had gone, and it was as though a peal of bells had abruptly stopped. It's too easy, we're told, to say that in that year, 1642, everything changed for Rembrandt for his work. That's the sentimental, romantic version to read art from life. But you know, something really had happened to Rembrandt, an end to flamboyance, an end to his theatrical mastery of the outward, noisy show of life. It was as though he'd turned down the volume of the world and switched on an inner, quiet radiance. The big gestures melt away and are replaced by a tender simplicity. Instead of a portrait gallery of the rich and powerful, a maidservant, leaning on a sill, caught between inside and outside, innocence and sex. Look at the highlight on her lower lip, the left hand toying with a necklace. Here too, in his drawings, just a few summary lines here and there that managed to conjure up an entire scene. It's a huge compliment, don't you think? Making us his partner in completion. 
giving us the benefit of the doubt that we wouldn't want anything so boring as the literal details. The problem, though, was that Rembrandt's critics didn't see him as offensively avant-garde. They saw him as offensively old-fashioned. Why? Because of a cultural sea change. For the first time in Holland, sophistication seemed far more important than simplicity and piety, the qualities the Dutch liked to think had brought them through their war against Spain. But now, peace had been declared, and by the 1650s, there was a perceptible sigh of relief. So just as Rembrandt's paintings were getting darker, the mood of Amsterdam was lightening and brightening. The founding fathers and mothers, modestly dressed in millstone ruffs, had given way to their children. The peacock generation, gorgeous in screaming scarlets and quaffed to the nines. Many of them had been sent abroad as part of their education and had come back eager to import cosmopolitan stylishness to the homespun republic. They weren't interested in austerity. They wanted to be like the Italians. They wanted pillars. All Rembrandt's murky browns and golds, those garter marks and flabby breasts, were a downer. We all know this story, don't we? The second generation, the inheritors, the trust fund brats, so embarrassed by their parents who are so old-fashioned, so parochial, and all they care about is church and business, business and church. And what a business too, trade, my dear, so tawdry. So off they go and buy themselves country villas, while some inky finger clerk manages the family investment. This leaves them to concentrate on what they really care about, cultivation. For art, they think, is not just a report unedited from nature. And it's certainly not about dwelling indiscriminately on ugliness just because it happens to be there. No, art is the divine road to harmony, its purity, its clarity. Away with the misshapen, bring on the age of refinement. And here's Rembrandt. No culture props, just those big, meaty hands stuck in his belt. Everything is starting to look heroically worn. The coat itself, the eyes pink-rimmed, the eyes of a man who never stops looking. And just look at the sketchiness of the whole thing. He just doesn't care about finish anymore. In fact, Rembrandt's in the process of doing something which horrified the classical academicians. He's abolishing the difference between a sketch and a painting. And he does it for the subjects he cares most about. He cares a lot about her. She's Hendrikia Stoffels, the soldier's girl from the Styx, who came into Rembrandt's house seven years after Saskia's death. Rembrandt had already taken his son's nurse, Hirtia Dirks, as his mistress. But then Hendrikia arrived, and it wasn't long before he wanted her in his bed and Hirtia out of it. Here's Hendrikia looking down into the water, the break of her legs through its surface, a little tour de force of illusionism. Rembrandt now isn't choosing his way of handling paint just as the fancy takes him, but to convey sensuous experience. So Hendrikia's shift pulled scandalously high, her neckline scandalously low, are painted thickly, while her skin tones are as liquid as the water itself.
And the way Rembrandt has painted her hands as just an unmodelled smear almost dares the critics to make an issue of it. You can hear them, can't you? Rembrandt van Rijn, oh yes, yes, very talented, but my God, so difficult, never finishes a painting. I think his best years are behind him, don't you? And what he's doing, rattling around in that big old house with his, <clears throat> excuse me, a woman, really don't know. You have heard, she's with a child, haven't you? Church deacon's quite shocked. Just a bit squalid, don't you think? That might explain why he does those rather peculiar etchings. Just who's going to buy them, I've really no idea. Running out of favours, running out of time, late with his loan repayments on the house, the coils of Rembrandt's ruin began to rope themselves around him ever more tightly. Finally, in July 1656, Rembrandt filed for bankruptcy. This is where Rembrandt would have come, to the Chamber of Insolvency. Passing through this door with its frieze of worthless stock certificates and rats scuttling through empty money chests of the profligate debtor. You just can't beat the Dutch for wagging their fingers at your wicked ways. Auction by auction, hammer blow by hammer blow, everything was taken. This wasn't just furniture, household stuff. It was also Rembrandt's own personal archive of art. The drawings and paintings, all the strange, fabulous stuff he'd collected, all gone. Then, the house itself. One thing he did manage to hold on to and that was a great mirror in the finest ebony wood frame. Titus, his son, found a bargeman who said, for a sum of money, sure, he'd carry it to their new house. So up on the bargeman's head it went, and off through the jostle of Amsterdam over cobbled streets and bridges. And at some point, the bargeman begins to sweat, his hands get slippery, his grip gets shaky. And then, as the bargeman was stepping off a bridge, Witnesses who came forward to testify for the bargeman said he hadn't bumped into anyone, he hadn't fallen down. The mirror must just have broken all by itself. But there it was, on the ground, a thousand shards and slivers, leaving Titus to carry home to his father just a frame with an empty centre. It's 1658, Rembrandt has lost everything. So how does he paint himself? Like a king, like a god, full frontal, mantled in lustrous gold. And it's the paint, that thick, luxurious paint, which gives him his power, his magic. No bankrupt's downcast eyes either, but a stare coming right at us little people who fancy we know something about art. A suggestion of lordly amusement playing about his eyes. His barrel chest soaks up the light, the belly swelling in front of us like a genie, the whole body pressing against the picture plane, challenging it to contain his massive authority. And if Rembrandt thinks that his way of painting has been part of the problem, He's certainly not going to abandon it now. Just the opposite, in fact. This is a painting that bellows defiance at the apostles of crisp clarity and contour. So you think, that stuff was a bit much, do you? He seems to be saying, just get a load of this. 